Katz is science policy officer for SAPEA, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, is a bit more about uh, the report itself. Uh, Alex Holst is policy manager at the Good Food Institute Europe, uh, who we're delighted to have as the co-hosts for this webinar. Um, Good Food Institute is a nonprofit focusing on transforming meat production for a more sustainable food system. Uh, John Toyerson is professor of economic psychology at the Department of Management at Aarhus University in Denmark, uh, where food and sustainability are among his areas of expertise. And he's also a member of the working group uh, that developed the SAPEA Evidence Review Report. And uh, we're delighted to welcome as well Chris Bryant, uh, social scientist from the University of Bath in the UK, who has a particular focus in his research on consumer responses to alternative proteins. So we're really delighted to uh, welcome all of these speakers along in just a moment. Um, Let's have a look at the program for today. So we'll be hearing first from Celine, uh, and then we'll get into a discussion with John and Alex, um, looking at the evidence, looking at consumer perceptions and uh, policy pathways. Before we hear from Chris, and then bring all our speakers together uh, for some final thoughts, and also bring your questions into the discussion uh, to put to our speakers. Uh, so you might like to note that the webinar is recorded, so you can feel free to share the link with colleagues it will be uploaded to our SAPEA website. Uh, if you're having any technical problems, uh, you might want to try to reconnect using the same link. If you're using the WebEx app, you might want to try the browser. Uh, Toby, uh, our colleague, can perhaps help you here as well. His email address is there. And this is a participatory webinar, um, so we'd be really delighted to hear from you uh, in the chat. Um, you can use the chat. Uh, one, one thing we ask is that you uh, share your chat messages with everyone. Um, so you should be able to see uh, in the right hand chat panel, uh, if you scroll down the option to share not only with the presenter or panelists, um, but to share with everyone and that way uh, we can start a little conversation going uh, there in the chat. So please do feel free uh, to send your questions and comments uh, during the presentation. Okay. So, uh, without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce uh, our first speaker then, uh, Celine Shearhart, um, to hear a little bit more about the SAPEA Evidence Review Report. Over to you, Thank you, Michael. Um, so, yeah, I will present some of the report's conclusions and particularly uh, those who, that are relevant to today's discussions uh, will provide a short sort of introductory overview. So just a reminder that SAPEA was asked by the group of chief scientific advisors to the commission to review what could be workable paths from a social sciences perspective to deliver an inclusive, just and timely transition to a sustainable food system in the EU. So first of all, a few broad conclusions. Uh, the review concluded that the current food system isn't sustainable, that business as usual is not a viable option, and that more radical change is required. There is also lots of evidence that food systems will play a central role in achieving other key necessary transitions required, for example, by the current climate emergency. So one key overarching point uh, is that transitioning to a more just and sustainable food system will depend on how food is framed, whether it's framed as a commodity, as a common good or as human rights, um, has an influence on how policy are developed and on sustainability outcomes. Um, and this is a, a, the group of chief scientific advisors recommended that food be framed more as a common good, for example. Another point is that any transition to a more just and sustainable food system will require the coordination of actions at multiple levels of governance and involving a wide range of actors that operates at a variety of scales on land and at sea. So this needs a high degree of coordination, adaptability and inclusiveness. And there are many, many actors in the system and all can somehow play a role. And there's also a need to address an uneven distribution of power across the food system to transition to a more just and sustainable food system. And all these conclusions are reflected in the advisor's uh, recommendations in, to the commission. So to, now to narrow it down a little bit, um, the report looks at the role of individuals as food consumers and agents of change. 
And there, working group members have reviewed briefly consumer attitudes and perceptions of new technologies in food, which is relevant to our discussion today. Because research shows that modifying diets and modes of consumption would produce significant co-benefits for health and the environment. So new technologies and new products can really play a role. So looking more closely at the evidence that was presented on that topic in the report, here are a few uh, points which I think can be highlighted. So when it comes to new technologies and food, it raises interesting questions of public acceptance, but also how best to incorporate such foods in existing diets at reasonable cost and acceptable, acceptable taste, as well as how to make them commercially viable and widely available. And individuals can be a driver for sustainability when they purchase food, but uh, individual behavior is very complex and it can be influenced by many, many factors, um, ethical factors, values, cultures, socioeconomic situations, habits. Uh, it's very complex. So choices are not formed in a vacuum. And for any successful uptake of innovations, it's important to understand those. Some evidence shows that people can generally be supportive of food innovations which have positive ecological benefits. But it also seems that consumer trust has to be earned. So this is one aspect of the evidence that's presented that, I, that I'm presenting uh, today here. Trust seems to be key. Uh, I spoke of uneven distribution of power before, and there is a fundamental information asymmetry between producers who know the production processes and those who are in the position to buy those who don't always. And in the evidence, one can identify several levels of trusts. There's trust in the production process and its impacts. So trust in companies, uh, there's a need for a great transparency. Trust in regulation that puts products on the market, in the integrity of government. Trust in science also. And uh, trust in sustainable food messaging. Because one needs to be familiar with the messaging and understand the messaging of you know, this is a sustainable product. And this can affect which interventions gain traction or not. So these were some evidence-based considerations from the CPR report, and I now leave the floor to Michael and the experts for a more in-depth discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Celine, and I think you really brought up a few points that are going to be absolutely fundamental to the rest of our discussion on trust, on power relations, on messaging. I'm really looking forward to hearing what our participants have to say. Um, but first, I would like to hear a little bit um, from all of you uh, participating uh, from your laptops. We're going to launch a quick poll to warm you up a little bit. I'm curious to know, uh, how often do you eat meat at the moment? Uh, we're going to launch a poll um, so you can let us know. So please feel free to have a look, that should have popped up. And in the meantime, I'd like to welcome our uh, first speakers, uh, Alex Holst and John Toyusen, uh, to join me. I'm very curious, uh, to hear some more of your thoughts on uh, consumer uptake of uh, alternative proteins. Uh, Alex, maybe I can come to you first. Um, can you tell us a little bit more, first of all, about what do we mean um, by alternative proteins? And uh, yeah, what are your initial thoughts on uh, the challenges that we face? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Michael. And thanks for um, having me and for hosting this discussion together with us. Um, yeah, you're right. Alternative proteins, you mentioned already, there are several different parts. And um, what we are really talking about today um, is cultivated meat or cultured meat um, this, that you already mentioned. So this is meat, real meat, real beef, real chicken, real pork made out of animal cells. So without the need to actually raise and slaughter an animal and all the, um, the um, damaging effects on the environment and public health that comes from that. Um, and plant-based meat, um, this is another type of alternative protein that many of us will be familiar with. Um, you can go in supermarkets right now and buy. And these, these new um, innovative plant-based meats, they are really targeted at meat eaters. Um, they mimic the flavor, the texture, the taste of real animal meat. Um, and that gets already in the, at the crux of it. Um, so the challenge we are all facing and that Celine mentioned is um, the way we currently produce meat um, in most cases is just not sustainable. Um, 
it's damaging the climate, um, it's damaging to biodiversity, to public health, it um, has animal welfare issues. So from our research um, at GFI, and we, um, we do extensive research on consumers and markets, we work with policymakers, businesses with academics, and what we see from our research time and time again is most consumers like the taste of meat, they want to continue eating it. Um, and they also like that it's affordable, it's relatively cheap. Um, so we have to square the, these two issues. And the way to do it is, we, as we believe, not to just tell consumers um, to change their behavior. We cannot just put all the burden of the change we need in the food system on individual consumers. First of all, that's not fair. And second of all, it just doesn't work. Um, we've tried it for decades. So we really have to meet the consumer where they are. That's why we need to develop plant-based and cultivated meats that can compete with conventional meat on price, on taste, and on availability. Okay, we're going to be hearing a little bit more about what matters to consumers and getting into that uh, a little bit more shortly. Uh, but firstly, I'd like to ask you, uh, John Thiersen, so uh, you were on the working group uh, that developed the evidence review report mm -hmm. that uh, Celine was talking about. Um, what is the evidence that uh, alternative proteins are important as part of a sustainable uh, food system? Well, as it is now, there's not like a lot of evidence. Uh, we have to say like there's so uh, if when you review the evidence, like there's a lot of things needed. Yeah, but like from what we already and and of course, uh, also much of the evidence that we actually have is maybe a little bit dated, like uh, compared to what Alex was uh, telling about. Like there's in the recent years, there's been a lot of progress in in developing new things that are maybe coming closer to to the requirements of consumers. Um, I think if we look at the, the total evidence and, and really briefly from a consumer pers perspective, um, as, as uh, Alex said, that there's um, <clears throat> the focus with this particular solution uh, to the diet problem, so to speak, uh, which is like plant-based and cultured meat is, uh, is that it, it creates an offer uh, to meat consumers to uh, eat differently without changing their behaviors and their habits. So it's like, it makes it convenient to change your eating habits. And which is, and like that is clearly as, as uh, a, a, a one of the fundamental uh, challenges uh, when, when we try to change people's diets to a more plant-based diet uh, is definitely that a lot of people feel that it's extremely difficult to make. They don't, people don't necessarily doubt that you can make tasty vegetarian or vegan meals, but they find it extremely difficult to do and inconvenient. So therefore it's like that coming, uh, that, that targeting a really important problem, but there's two other problems that doesn't target as also uh, was said, namely the taste issue and the price issue. And um, so, and, 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 and one more problem with this, this whole approach, which is also a challenge is there's a tendency to a negative framing, meaning that when we promote uh, alternative meats, we really promote it as things that it's not. Whereas really uh, we should promote it as what it is. Mm. We meaning that, that so it's, it's protein, but it's not meat. It's like meat like, but it's not cruel to animals. Uh, it's meat like, but it's not harming the environment. So it's like, so it's sold by what it's not. And of course, what we would like to do is say like with, to, to get a, this out on the market is to say, this is delicious. This is a wonderful food that is easy to prepare and affordable and so on. Um, like we, there's some studies, for instance, that show also like when, when we ask consumers about the preferences, they actually dislike these negative framings and would rather like it, it be presented positively. Like for instance, just calling it plant-based rather than like meatless is actually a positive because it's telling what it is mm -hmm. rather than what it's not. So I think that that probably is the biggest challenge. And, and in a way with the, the whole uh, focusing on replacing meat, 
is of course needed, like like or seen as a good tactic to to uh, target um, meat consumers and the, the 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 problem of changing habits. But on the on the other hand, it has that other side to it that it is meat without some of the negatives, and then we have to make we like mention these negatives. So I think that's really the challenge here to to develop the positive arguments. And and that's the way like that could be, in my view, the way yeah, to yeah. to really use this innovative products in a way that could create and maybe like and the, and crowding out like really reducing meat consumption by having people choosing something else. Yeah, I'm curious to hear your thoughts, Alex, on this uh, messaging and the need for, for for positive messaging as opposed to uh, what alternative proteins are not. You must have a lot of experience with this. Yeah, indeed. And I think John is exactly right when it comes to framing and messaging to consumers. And that's actually what we see um, more and more companies in the plant-based space doing. Um, you have advertising a product as delicious, as healthy, um, all the good things about it. And these new products really, um, they are quite tasty. And we see the same with cultivated meat producers. Obviously, these products are not on the market yet, but that's how they market them. Um, just on cultivate meat, I mean, this is real animal meat. This is not a, a faux meat. This is um, on a cellular, on a molecular basis. This is real animal meat. So that's exactly um, where meat eaters who might be a little squishy about switching to plant-based, they don't feel good about it. That's what we see in research that they really want to go um, or they tend to be more open to, to try cultivated meat. Um, when we talk about the, the effects of current meat productions, um, that's something I think we need to do. We need to address and Sapi addressed it in the report when we talk um, in policy circles and um, talk about what kind of policies we want to promote and why. Um, but I think John's absolutely right when it comes to consumer messaging. Uh, we should focus on the positives and there are plenty um, when it comes to plant-based and cultivated meat. Yeah, we're putting the consumer under some pressure in a way. How do we consider the consumer's role when it comes to this transition uh, towards alternative proteins? John, I wonder if uh, you have some thoughts on that. I, I, I think that's a difficult one. Like, I mean, um, the, like, we 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 don't societally have evolved norms for proper behavior, and I think that's what you're implying that uh, that uh, developing a norm saying that like eating meat is improper or uh, like anti-normative. Um, I also don't see that happening like anything soon, like any any time soon. Uh, I, I, so, so, um, what, when it comes to eating a diet that is more sustainable, because that's pr primarily what we're talking about, like, and, and, and also, of course, a more healthy diet, but, uh, you know, uh, the, the healthy diet is something you do for yourself, like, oh, maybe for your children, and you could say you have a responsibility to serve a healthy diet for your children. I think most parents feel that. Uh, but uh, and uh, the sustainability arguments are about a, the, that you have a, a responsibility to society that your diet is uh, indeed uh, sustainable or living up to certain sustainability standards. Um, I think that that kind of message is, is, uh, is something that can like NGOs can promote that and so on, but like I think governments have really difficulties doing that. I don't think they will do it because um, there's a lot of ambiguity and there's of course a conflict with like so. What about farmers? <laughs> you know, like so we also have a responsibility to the local farmers, the local economy, the local community. So. My take on this is that I, I think what we are seeing in many countries of the world is a general uh, increase in the conscience about sustainability issues and the general feeling of responsibility for sustainability. Uh, and that that implies also that you need to think about responsibility of your own acts. Um, that's a broader focus, and then uh, people will. Uh, my take on that, like, would be that then people would would 
be allowed their free choice to choose which ways they would um, live up to that responsibility. So, and 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 of course, the the I I I've written about this as contribution ethics, like that uh, when it comes to the environment, we all share responsibility for the environment. We like not no, no individual is powerful enough to carry it on their own, or is alone and creating the problem. So we share this responsibility. And therefore, and, I, and like there's also research that suggests that's actually how most people actually view it. And uh, so we all have the responsibility for doing our fair share. What that is, like that could be in, in your diet, it could also be in your traveling, it could also be, uh, and, and of course, ideally, it's in all these areas. But, mm -hmm. but, but like that, that is something that's evolving gradually. We do see some research showing that people who have a higher sense of general responsibility towards the environment actually eat less meat. So okay. we actually do suggest that this kind of responsibility also have an impact on, on meat consumption. Uh, okay. so, so I'm just saying it's not like that it means that it's not connected, but it's just that I don't, I, I, I think the discourse on saying to consumers that it's your responsibility not to eat meat. I I don't think governments would ever go out and, and say stuff like that. At least not in the feasible future. Like yeah. it needs to be a shared responsibility. And um, I wanted to bring in uh, a question for you, Alex, uh, from the chat. She was asked to Celine, but I think uh, you um, will also uh, have an answer for this. Uh, Adam Shrigi is asking uh, which companies, in your opinion, are leading innovation and or commercialization efforts. Of both plant-based and cultivated meat and also asks what are your thoughts on fermentation and micro proteins i don't know if we will get on that um but do you have examples alex of uh, good practices in innovation and commercialization sure and we could it's an excellent question we could have a, a whole another webinar about this actually we did another webinar just on the topic of fermentation just a few months ago at gfi but just to be very brief and focus maybe on europe because that's most interesting in this context um we have actually one of the most advanced uh, cultivated meat startups right here in europe um, most of meat in the Netherlands, um, meatable in the Netherlands. We have companies in France developing uh, cultured uh, foie gras. Um, we have Spanish companies, UK companies. We have the um, basis here in Europe, the commercial talent, the scientific expertise. But what we are really lacking um, is the government backing and the right policies to advance these technologies. Um, and similar on the plant-based side, Europe is one of the pioneers um, when it comes to plant-based meat. We have in most European countries, we have higher market shares of plant-based meat than in the US. Um, not to say it's only happening in Europe, there's a lot of development um, in Asia Pacific right now. You mentioned the approval in Singapore of the first cultured meat product. Um, Israel is a food innovation powerhouse. Um, and seeing those investments that are being made in those um, other regions, um, the US of course as well, and seeing the regulatory approvals, I think there's really a risk that in the EU, um, yeah, we risk being left behind a little bit in this field. We, we, have, the, we have all the starting um, material that we need to really accelerate the growth in this um, and to reap the, the benefits for society because that, I mean, in the end, that's what we want. It's not about, oh, this is an exciting techie sector. No, it's about we want these alternatives because they will reap all the benefits on climate change, biodiversity loss, antimicrobial resistance and warfare. So here governments can really um, make a choice investing in open access science um, that would accelerate these entire industries. Um, the right regulatory playing field, that's what we need to do now. I know we will talk about policy options later, but um, there's a lot there we could do. Yep, definitely massive potential. Okay, well, I'm curious to uh, hear from, we're seeing some questions flooding in already for later in the conversation. And I see from the poll as well, uh, that we have some meat eaters uh, joining us uh, in the webinar, although 35% of you never eat meat. Um, so, okay, well, it's interesting to, yeah. I also want to ask um, a follow-up question to that, and it's related to the point uh, that John was making um, about consumers uh, thinking about sustainability. Uh, to what extent would you say that your eating habits are influenced by sustainability concerns? So that's a second question uh, for the poll. Um, and so we'll, we'll let that run. And while you're answering, um, I want to come back to you, uh, John and Alex, uh, to ask a little bit, as you were saying, it, it's uh, nice to, to talk a little bit about policy pathways. You mentioned uh, what, what's at stake for Europe. Um, what really are the, are, the, are the challenges that Europe faces at the moment? Um, what, do we, what policy do we need uh, to make this future of uh, alternative proteins a reality? 
Uh, John, I wonder if I can I can start with you to to get this in there. What what challenges do we face in terms of policy? Uh, I, I'm like, there's definitely more things one can do in in this respect here. Um, I I'm not uh, very familiar with the culture of meat, and I I think like the what Alex said was like the key thing that we 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 simply need the policy process to go in and do the stuff to get it accepted. Uh, and and also um, uh, do the types of analysis they need to uh, to determine the, the extent to which they want to support this. But like uh, uh, in in addition, like we have a general problem for this area, which is farm policy and agricultural policy in Europe. Like uh, which is the, the the types of subsidies. Like there's a huge still huge subsidies to, to ag agricultural production in Europe. And this, uh, these subsidies are not necessarily, well, I'm not a political scientist and, and so on, but let me, with that reservation, let me just say that it doesn't really follow carbon footprint. Uh, so, uh, and obviously a uh, first step to like in order to get the prices right at least you know like would be to make sure that the prices actually reflect the carbon footprint uh, and and the, this can be done in different ways of course like making sure that the the the, the subsidies to the farm sector is reflecting this uh, this uh, concern uh, would be one thing another thing is like in denmark there's uh, we have for quite some time now been discussing carbon uh, tax and uh, like there's kind of a consensus evolving that we want a general carbon tax on all production activities, which means that all the basic products, like depending on the carbon footprint, will then be reflected on prices. And there's been calculations that how much would that mean for a steak, you know, versus an apple and so on. And and obviously that is one way of helping the 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 the, the market mechanism, which would also have implications for plant-based and, and and cultured meat uh so so that would be one thing that that and, and i mean it's not completely unrealistic there are countries that have already implemented stuff like that uh the other thing uh and and since we know that the the price issue is actually a, a really important issue for people's choices of food the other thing would be labeling and but of course not to go forward with like the whole transparency issue that that um that uh, also both Celine and, and Alex uh, was talking about that we need we need, like for the for the, the these new sectors for plant based and and uh, and cultured we actually need calculations that makes it possible to label them we don't know yeah I mean, like obviously um, a a uh, a meat that's based on legumes has a higher carbon footprint due to the processing than legumes in themselves. Uh, as it does now, we don't have these numbers. So that's of course like that kind of transparent and, and which will of course make some consumers wonder. So we need the transparency, we need the calculations for that. And of course, at the end, the information that consumers can draw on, like which could be in terms of labeling trustworthy information. Okay. And Alex, does that reflect your approach? So a focus on uh, Carbon on reducing carbon footprint as a as a policy argument and uh, focus on labeling. I mean, to an extent, yes. I think John is right. Labeling is important, and consumers should um, get all the information they need in order to make sustainable choices. Um, and obviously, carbon is, is a huge concern for all of us. Um, but connecting that back to to what John said earlier and what I mentioned is. Um, Sustainable can, sustainability considerations are important for consumers, for some consumers, but the foundational drivers, and that's what our um, comprehensive analysis of the existing literature on, on consumer behavior, um, especially for plant-based meat shows, the foundational motivation of consumers uh, is, the, is the product um, affordable, is it delicious, is it convenient to buy? And only if those are met, then considerations about sustainability, health, maybe animal welfare come in. That counts for most consumers. And, Sometimes in these discussions, we also talk about consumers as a monolith, they're different consumer groups with different preferences. And mm -hmm. as I said earlier, we need to meet them where they are. So um, I think it's more important at this stage that consumers really focus on making plant-based and cultivated meat more affordable and making them delicious. Because let's face it, um, especially plant-based has grown 
fine over the next years, but the products are not quite there yet. Um, plant-based meat, the new um, really tasty plant-based meat products are more expensive than cheap animal meat. Um, and cultivated meat is not on the market yet, at least not um, if you're not living in Singapore and, and going to a high um, cost restaurant. So there is a way to go for us there to really make those a reality. Um, and the problem is we don't really have the time. And we have the climate emergency right now. We have the record uh, rates of uh, species loss and biodiversity reduction. Um, antimicrobial resistance is a really scary um, prospect. Um, so we don't really have the time to just try to um, nudge consumers, um, put some labels just um, on the product. We need to really fundamentally change the way we produce meat. Um, and that we can only do if governments heavily invest in these production processes. Okay. Yeah, John, any thoughts on this? Uh... I, I obviously agree that like, uh, as it is now, at least from a marketing perspective, taste and, and price are the most important things. But like, on the other hand, I, I believe that for in the longer term, of course, we need these other transparency issues and um, the kind of support uh, for for the development of this kind of product production here um, is, of course, depending on the government really believe in this, <laughs> and so they need they need, of course, this info. This info. Uh, I I do appreciate that there could be like when we talk cultured meat, a need for government in, uh, stepping in with with heavily uh, heavy support to develop this this uh, this area, and and of course there it's the sectors and our others. Uh, Obligation to give them proper information to make these kind of decisions, because that's a priority in the longer term. I, I definitely think the other things like also for the cost issue, uh, we need to. Uh, it target this thing about the agricultural subsidies and uh, and for 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 meat production and uh, and um, uh, um, taxation that is actually targeting. Um, the CO2 emissions, like it's a broader issue though, and, and uh, I tend to agree with Alex without being like an expert in it that probably don't have the really the time to wait for it and it would be a, an advantage to have uh, governments um, subsidized or going in and, and supporting uh, the actual production of, of the cultivated meat. But I have to say, I don't know sufficient about the actual cultivated meat. Uh, to 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 really judge that as as an expert. Just to jump in there, um, yeah, just very briefly, um, John, I think John is exactly right on on the evidence side. We need the, we need the right evidence to to show that actually these these new foods um, they will will bring us all the benefits um, that they promise. Um, the good thing is when we look at cultivated, I mean, when we look at plant based meat, I think the evidence is in um, like Eat Lancet report, IPCC. We know um, eating plant based is just far better for for the environment, um, for public health, and for animals, for cultivated meat, we see mounting evidence, especially on the environmental side, um, that um, there are huge benefits when it comes to land use, um, when it comes to um, water use, um, greenhouse gas emissions um, from the life cycle analyses that have been done, um, overwhelmingly show like reductions um, of greenhouse gas emissions uh, per kilogram of meat between 76% and 96%, which is these are huge numbers. There, there, are, there are still gaps there. Um, I cannot talk too much about a very exciting new research that comes out in about two weeks um, in ULCA that is the most comprehensive that has ever been done on cultivated meat. But um, having looked at the um, at the preliminary results, this is entirely possible. This is something we can make happen, but we need to really invest in open access research and innovation. And the EU with its Horizon Europe program, national governments can really make a difference here and accelerate this transition. I think you very nicely answered a question we had submitted uh, from Karina Zerger, who was asking, you know, what, what makes you think that plant-based or cultivated meat is more sustainable? Um, and it seems that this question is far from being solved, and I think you've, uh, you've addressed a couple of those points. But yeah, along similar lines, John, I would like to ask you as well, what would you like to see in terms of research? What should be the priorities now in terms of uh, gaining evidence uh, on alternative proteins? Yeah, well, we... It appears that some of this has already been provided, but like I, I definitely believe that, like in in, in Denmark, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we we uh, in, an organization uh, uh, published online a new database of um, the carbon footprint of all foods, like you know all the the foods that are, are well known, but like there's not really evidence to to these 
food alternatives. And like we, we actually need that. So we need life cycle analysis for the most important of those, you know, to feed into the policy process and also like, you know, consumer demand and so on. So that, that would be one priority. I, I'm also, I, I, I find it highly likely that at least plant-based based, um, should be more sustainable. But as I said, um, th these foods are of course processed foods. So it depends a lot on the processes. Uh, and, and, and obviously, uh, as I said before, a processed meat that's based on legumes will have a higher carbon footprint than the legumes themselves. So, and, and, and as I already like one asked this question in the chat, and this is an obvious thing we need, we need the evidence in order to, for the, the policy process to be running. And then of course, we still, there's quite a lot of consumer research we still need in order to market these, uh, these products. Uh, like, I mean, we know a lot about the barriers, uh, but there's still lots, lots of research to do, and and that is, of course, my field. So I would like yeah. financing to my research. But uh... <laughs> great, and I see Alexander is asking in the chat as well if you could provide a link to the database. That would be great. Uh, don't hesitate to type it in the chat. Um, Alex, I wanted to ask you. So we see that there are some countries uh, where headway is being made uh, in the chat. People are mentioning um, some various examples from uh, from across Europe. Um, in terms of Making progress on policy, uh, what countries would you pick out as um, particular interesting case studies that the rest of Europe can learn from? Yeah, so I mean, I already mentioned Singapore in the regulatory field, um, and Singapore definitely was the pioneer there. Um, the regulatory approval in Singapore um, was a huge milestone because this is a this is a thorough, um, comprehensive regulatory framework that they have in place. So they showed it can be done. Like it's an it's a safe, it's nutritious. Um, the cultured meat product that was um, that was um, approved there. Um, Israel, I also mentioned Israel really has just decided, well, we want to be a leader in food innovation. We want to be self-sufficient. It's a small country similar to Singapore. Um, so we make massive research investment in this field. Is in Israel has some of the most advanced startups in the cultivated meat space, especially. And if we look at Europe, um, I mean, the Netherlands is one of the countries I would pick out. Um, it's already one of the absolute leaders in plant-based meat. Um, and plant-based protein more broadly, um, obviously dairy, seafood, eggs, these are all um, all types of animal products that can be replaced with, with plant-based products. Um, and in cultivated meat, um, just the other day, I think it was actually two days ago, the Netherlands published their national protein plan. Um, several member states, or may, almost all member states now are, are either writing their national protein plans or have already published them. And the Netherlands was one of the first to actually um, put in there a commitment to invest in research of cultivated meat, for example. So there we really see best practices um, in, in some European countries. Um, and it's a little bit of a race now, and we hope that more countries will actually join in um, and try to be the first. And the first country that really accelerates the sector they can they have bragging rights like until the end of time for actually developing these products and bringing them on the market and we hope more will want to do that okay um thank you both very much we've covered a lot of ground in a in a short space of time and i'll be inviting you both back uh, to join the discussion um but uh yeah so thank you both very much uh, for your points on this uh, really interesting uh, points that you've made um, but I, before we introduce our contributor, Chris Bryant, I want to ask uh, one last poll. Um, so we saw from the previous poll in terms of uh, how much your eating habits are influenced by sustainability concerns. Um, we should be seeing the results uh, from that poll in just a moment. Um, but I also want to uh, ask a third uh, poll question, which is to ask, would you try uh, cultured meat instead of conventional meat? So, Conventional. Okay, here is a, a tricky word, um, but that's uh, my my third question to you in the poll. So uh, we'll hear from you in just a moment to see your thoughts on that. Um, but in the meantime, I would like to uh, introduce our contributor, Chris Bryant. Um, so Chris is a social scientist uh, from the University of Bath in the UK, um, and Chris, your research interests particularly focusing on uh, consumer perceptions, consumer behavior around alternative proteins. I'm really interested uh, to ask you on uh, your thoughts about the conversation so far and how your work um, feeds into this discussion. 
Yeah, thank you uh, very much for having me, and it's great to contribute uh, to this conversation. Um, yeah, I will certainly echo a lot of the sentiments that I've heard in the conversation so far. Really, uh, as far as consumers are concerned, we're definitely hitting on the central point here that Many people actually already understand that there are good reasons to be eating less meat um, for the environment and pe people are increasingly aware of this um, and also for their health. And uh, there's also, you know, rising concern about the animals involved as well. So people kind of get those points, but it's really pragmatic barriers to preventing people from changing their diets and people talk about uh, price and taste implications of doing that as we've heard about and also the convenience so i think for me that's why that these uh, new alternative protein products play such a key role in enabling people to kind of start doing what they on some level know that they ought to be doing already um and uh yeah i think that they just lower the bar really for people to um consume in line with those values okay yeah, we, uh, we have some interesting questions about um, consumer perceptions. Uh, Zoe Hill is asking, uh, do you think that the perception of these foods, so alternative proteins, as processed uh, has an effect, yeah, will be an issue, uh, she says. Um, and if so, how do we tackle that? Yes, uh, yeah, there, there is something that is kind of a pressure point for uh, a lot of these cultured meats and, and plant-based products as well. Some people uh, can see them as being processed, and in particular, uh, there have been, um, you know, consumer concerns around the salt content, for example, in some plant-based products. Um, what I would say is that this is kind of one of the... Uh, many different things that types of consumers might care about the real driving things that apply to everybody are taste price and convenience and then health and things of that nature are kind of fourth on that list mm -hmm. uh something something like optional that some people will be concerned about um and really i think that the proliferation of these products and the competition of them uh against each other enables them to carve out different niches uh there will be room for products with like clean labels, you know, with a minimum number of ingredients that are minimally processed. Um, and there will be room for, you know, some some other types of products, which uh, perhaps, you know, do more to in enhance the taste offering to consumers, for example. So that is one thing that some consumers will be concerned about. Um, but for most people, taste and price and convenience really are the, uh, the big three uh, driving purchase decisions. And is that the same whether we're talking about cultured meat or plant-based meat? Do those remain the three main concerns? Yeah, well, uh, interestingly, some consumer data shows that different groups of people tend to be uh, differentially interested in these different types of alternative proteins. Um, so, for example, plant-based uh, existing meat alternative products tend to be most appealing to people who have kind of vegetarian-inclined diets, meat reducers. Um, we have about one third of the people in the webinar today are vegetarians. Um, mm -hmm. Perhaps many of them are in, uh, familiar with these products. Uh, and cultured meat, which, as Alex has said, is you know real animal meat, uh, tends to be something that vegetarians are not actually that interested in eating, and tends to be more appealing to heavier meat eaters. Uh, and so we can kind of see these alternative products um appealing to different sectors of the market in that way um so there's reason for us to believe that both cultured meat and plant-based meat can play an important role in this transition and how much does it matter what we call these alternative proteins because we've heard a few different uh we've talked about uh cultured meat uh, cultivated meat um you read in the newspapers about lab-grown meat what difference does it make how we refer uh, to alternative proteins yeah, so, uh, well, there's a couple of issues here. The first is, as you say, like the prefix word. Um, uh, particularly, this has been discussed in relation to cultured meat, sometimes called, uh, seemingly mainly in America, called cultivated meat. Um, Europeans seem to have stuck with cultured meat to uh, a little bit of a larger extent from what I've seen. Um, in the past, the industry has also used the term clean meat, um, but the industry has now moved away from that term, uh, mostly in the interests of kind of clarity and transparency uh, for consumers. 
really the challenge has been to find a name which um, kind of intuitively describes what the product is, but without bringing up uh, unnecessary and actually untrue um, negative associations. You mentioned the name lab grown meat, which is, you know, often used in media and kind of colloquially. Um, well, not only is this off putting to consumers potentially, but it's also inaccurate in terms of the uh, products that consumers will actually be buying. This won't be, you know, something that was actually grown in a laboratory by the time uh, you're buying it in the supermarket. Um, so, yeah, it's it's been something of a challenge there and it's uh, there's data suggests that those different names are sort of differentially appealing to consumers. And the 2nd part of this is really um, about the term. Uh, meat and, you know, we can talk about dairy products as well. And this is something that we've seen recently in uh, European regulation, the kind of battle over calling plant based products, uh, meaty names and also, uh, I guess, dairy like names. Um, bizarrely, uh, the European Parliament voted to allow 1 and disallow the other. It seems like there's probably going to be some close contentions uh, for the products of cellular agriculture as well, um, possibly driven by some of the same interests in terms of restricting these uh, objects and being able to call themselves meat, for example. Um, so that's definitely something for uh, people advocating for cellular agriculture products to be aware of. Uh, there will be potentially regulating challenges around that aspect of the naming as well. Absolutely. And what about your work? Uh, can you tell us a bit more about uh, the studies that you've done or what you're working on now uh, in relation to consumer perceptions? Yeah, um, I, we, I actually just had a uh, really cool study come out today, um, which I'm very pleased about um, showing we have uh, data from a large representative sample of a thousand people in Belgium, um, taken in 2019 and then again in 2020. And we showed a significant increase in satisfaction with plant based meat alternatives, uh, from 44% of people in 2019 saying that they were satisfied with these products up to 51% in 2020. Um, so just in the space of, I think the two waves are about 18 months apart. Um, and in the, in that short space of time, we've seen really quite a significant increase in the number of people saying that they're, uh, satisfied with meat alternative products as they, as they exist at the moment. So these um, are people who already elsewhere, consume, or who already consume plant-based, uh, meat products or. Yeah. So the, the question in the, uh, survey was something along the lines of, um. I think it's either to what, uh, to what extent do they, oh, it's like, to what extent do they meet your needs? Um, so this is people answering, uh, kind of on the affirmative end of the scale to say that these products were, were meeting their needs to, to some significant extent. Um, and the important thing is that we saw that, that big increase in a short space of time, which really indicates how quickly these products are coming along. Um, and I think that there's, I think that there'll be kind of a dynamic to that where it's self perpetuating in the sense that more people will eat these products as more people eat these products. Um, there's research to show that people are more likely to uh, opt for meat alternatives if they're told that the market share for those products is higher. So there's this kind of social signaling effect going on in terms of uh, what we're signaling to each other is acceptable to eat. Um, and also there's a moral aspect to that as well. I think it's a very different prospect sort of having the debate about the the ethics of vegetarianism for example when you have like a 5% vegetarian population compared to when you have like a 30% vegetarian population right. suddenly it's uh, an ethical an ethical contention to be taken much more seriously it seems okay uh, there's a question here i'd like to bring in about uh, consumer perceptions uh, from madeleine cost uh, she asks considering eu citizens continued opposition to gmos what is the feasibility of cultured meat arriving in Europe? So I wondered, Chris, can, is it comparable consumer responses to, to GMOs and cultured meat? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, uh, there is some data to suggest that European consumers are a little more conservative around kind of food technology than Americans, for example, and GMOs is a good example of this. Um, yeah, we know as well that for many people, it's kind of like, 
just grouped into the same category of like science and technology and food. People don't necessarily differentiate between um, the uh, the different technologies there. It is certainly something for uh, the, having said all that data does suggest that there is uh, higher acceptance of cultured meat directly compared to GM products. Um, and there's also different data showing that cultured meat products, which uh, say something like, you know, no GMO ingredients uh, are much, much more appealing to consumers as well. Um, so I think that it's something where the obvious the uh, benefits are a little more obvious to consumers. People more intuitively understand the point of cultured meat than perhaps they do with regard to GMOs. So data does suggest that people are more accepting of cultured meat than they are of GMOs, but certainly there's similarities there and it's definitely something to be aware of from a regulatory perspective. We It would be a huge missed opportunity really uh, if cultured meat were to go in the same direction as GMOs. Okay, one last question on uh, consumer perceptions. I, I can't resist asking this one as well. Uh, Pat Colopi asks, uh, we've heard a lot about the importance of taste, texture, price, and sustainability of meat alternatives, but where does appearance factor in? Um, yeah, how many of these meat alternatives attractive for consumption? Yeah, uh, it's a really good question. There is definitely um, some amount of consumer uh, appeal that's coming from these products looking similar to the products that they're replacing. Um, and I think that that is playing an important role in terms of consumers perceived similarity of these products, right? You could have something that tasted exactly the same, but if it was like a, a green burger, you know, you would, you would obviously know this is kind of weird. Um, so definitely it is important to some extent. Um, and yeah, products def like dairy products and uh, plant-based meat products as well increasingly do look quite a lot like the products that they are looking to replace. Um, it's something that is going to be relevant to the consumer's decision of whether to buy the product initially, maybe, but probably not whether to buy it again, um, which will still come down to their experience of the taste of the product. Um, so I think that, yeah, pro probably the answer is that products need to be like a minimal standard of attractiveness, <laughs> but uh, really yeah. the taste is going to be the important thing in uh, whether the consumer goes back and buys that product again. Brilliant. Thanks, Chris. I wonder if you uh, would mind sticking around to answer some more questions from our uh, participants uh, with the rest of the panel. Um, I'll invite everyone back uh, in just a moment. I wanted to uh, first look at the, the results of the polls uh, that we've been asking. So our last question was, uh, would you try cultured meat? Um, and uh, the majority have said yes, definitely. Um, Fifty-seven percent of participants here. Perhaps not a representative sample of the European population, but it's certainly interesting to see that uh, you're absolutely willing to try. And I, yeah, I wonder if we'd phrase the question differently, um, whether there might have been a different response. But this is uh, uh, another question. I'd like to uh, bring back all of our speakers. Um, we still have some uh, questions remaining. And uh, we did say that the webinar would be an hour. Um, and so I realized that some um, participants uh, joining uh, might need to jump off in five minutes, but um, please uh, remember that the webinar is available online. We're recording this. And so uh, if you do need to leave, um, don't worry, you can uh, catch the end of the webinar uh, uh, online on the Sapaya website. Um, but I wanted to bring back um, Alex, uh, John, and uh, Celine uh, to hear a bit. Well, I'll, ask you, I'll be asking you for your thoughts, but I, we've had some really interesting questions coming in and I wanted to make sure that uh, I put some more of these to you. Um, one question uh, that I think, I know some of you will have some answers to uh, from Anne Bogdansky. Uh, she agrees that policy will be key to promote and regulate the alternative protein markets uh, based on solid scientific evidence. And uh, she asks, so we see a big push in investment in alternative proteins in Europe. How do you estimate the potential on other continents? Uh, do the UN have a role to play in raising awareness about benefits and risks? Um, I'm not sure who might like to uh, talk about this, the, the potential beyond Europe. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to give my first thoughts and maybe then sure. someone else can join. Um, I think it's definitely right that um, other countries, other regions have a huge role to play. Um, I mentioned um, Asia Pacific, China is actually after um, China and India. These are 
two countries where we will actually see the most growth for meat demand over the next decades. And the UN already has um, identified this as a huge challenge. Um, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, um, the United Nations Environmental Program, they see this uh, projected rise in meat demand and they are looking for solutions. Um, and so that's something we at GFI are actually doing. We are engaging with um, the United Nations in the lead up to the UN Food Systems Summit, which will be um, taking place later in this year. Um, and we are working with them to make sure that alternative proteins are on the agenda um, and are um, endorsed as one of the viable solutions to to transition in, into a better food system future. So definitely, that's a huge role to play. Okay, and Carolina has a follow up. Carolina Perales uh, asks, what about emerging countries, for example, in Latin America? We also see uh, these kinds of consumption trends uh, over there. I don't know if any of you have uh, worked on or analyzed data from uh, uh, from countries, for example, in Latin America. Uh, can I follow up with a thing? In the, I mean, I, Please. I think there's two things that like will will have an impact uh, for like, internationally, and uh, and um, that is <clears throat> differences in in openness to new foods uh, and different types of foods, and uh, how attached or how attached one is to meat and how uh, open one is to plant based. And and I, I I do believe that many of the emerging countries and including and not least China and, and India are are more like China is, is known for a, a very open uh, attitude towards different types of food, and and India has a very strong vegetarian tradition. So um, and it's much easier to get new foods in early before people have very well established uh, attitudes and habits with regard to meat. So I really think that there's a, that these countries should have be a media focus really and like and that there's huge opportunities there to get in early and establish oneself as but it has to be as I said earlier these foods have to be established as delicious, good, nourishing, healthy alternatives. So like you know, and and uh, uh, they can even be in the on the expensive side in the beginning, because these are these countries are also very status oriented, uh, and 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 therefore actually there could be a Tesla effect. I'm t talking from from like the elect uh, um, the electronic ele electric vehicles market that like getting in with these as positioned as luxury. Yeah, protein sources like uh, that are tasty and have all these things. It, it's actually a huge opportunity. I think it's in many ways much easier to, uh, and in that way maybe there could be a chance to avoid the uh, the huge shift towards higher uh, meat based consumption in these countries. Uh, so um, I believe Latin America is more of a challenge. They really like meat, as, like in, in Argentina and Brazil and all of these countries. I think that's well known. So that their the challenge is bigger. Uh, but of course, I, I think more similar to what we see in Europe and United States. But I think that in the American countries in Asia, it might be actually the, the place where, where uh, these new types of food uh, have the biggest opportunities. And that could also be Maybe not a coincidence that it's Singapore that the first place to to uh, uh, approve uh, cultured meat. Mm. Just to is very this... briefly jump in, yeah, um, please. because Brazil is really interesting, and and that's what you said, John. I think it's that's the instinct of most people to think about those regions. Um, we have actually a team in Brazil working with some of the largest meat producers in the country, and one example is JBS, like one of the largest meat processors in the world if not the largest, and they are actually investing heavily in plant-based meat. Um, we do, we have done some consumer research in Brazil, and you're right, there are like traditional associations with meat, but we even see in a country like Brazil, we see a huge shift. Um, and that's of course huge because Brazil is not producing a lot of meat. In Brazil, we have the Amazonian forest, you have all the problems with clearing the forest for um, soy cultivation, um, for grazing, for, for cattle. So um, there are huge shifts, even in countries like Brazil, which uh, is, well, should make us very optimistic on that front. Yeah, I wanted to ask you as well, Chris, about, uh, so John made this point about people's cultural attachments to meat and the role that it plays in their lives. 
Uh, does, does that is that reflected in your work as well? Uh, these varying national attitudes towards meat. Oh, I think you're still on mute. Pardon me, the uh, mute button is a little sensitive. <laughs> um, yes, yes, there are, uh, of course, um, very many ways where meat is kind of playing a, a central role in uh, cultural events and traditions um, in all sorts of different cultures. Uh, and I think that that's one of the things that uh, plant-based and in particular cultured meat is going to be able to smooth over as we say, we don't have the capacity to be producing meat at the level that we have been, um, and for all of the people who want to eat it, uh, but we can adapt and um, integrate these products into those cultures in a way which is kind of minimally disruptive. Um, I think that's a lot of the point about these products is to try to minimize disruption for consumers, and that goes for kind of, um, you know, uh, cultural and traditional aspects as well as like straightforward everyday consumption um so yeah celine i know that so you mentioned in your introduction about the uh, evidence review report that the notion of narrative um around food is really important here and i know that the, re the report as well touches on a lot of points um around food as culture and food as tradition i wondered if you had some uh, some thoughts on that uh, well, one immediate thought is uh, when I heard uh, John talk at the beginning about this, these uh, framings of this cultured meat. And uh, I've noticed that this, these questions of fr framings and what values we put to, to, to all sorts of things, to products, to food in general, uh, uh, are um, gaining more and more traction in research and um, I think this was my immediate thought: is that we shouldn't we shouldn't um, overlook these uh, questions, which can seem a bit conceptual at the beginning, but uh, but play a big role in in how we how we view things, and then how they're politicized, and how this they then gain traction in society. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm just wondering if we have time to squeeze in another couple of questions uh, from participants. Um, yeah, there is another related one on uh, Europe's influence on the rest of the world. Uh, Jiang Tran uh, points out that Europe is ahead uh, compared to other regions, especially developing countries, uh, in terms of plant-based food consumption and sustainability. So while climate, climate change is a world challenge, uh, what could European countries do to influence the change in other parts of the world? We mentioned this change. What is the responsibility of uh, the EU and European countries, um, both on big picture policy level as well as individual consumer level? Um, and if anybody has any, any thoughts on this one, Alex? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in here. I mean, Europe has, um, it's right that on the plant based side, Europe um, is, is fairly advanced on the plant based food side. Um, Europe really has an enormous influence in the world. Um, when it comes to regulation, for example, we've seen this in other policy areas, for example, um, chemical um, safety regulation, basically Europe or in, um, data protection with the general data protection um, uh, regulation of the EU. Basically, Europe um, and the EU um, in these areas functions as a global standard setter. Um, and if Europe and the EU really want to um, go all in on, uh, on plant based meat and cultivated meat, they should try to um, take a similar role. Um, we have a very robust um, existing regulatory framework in place in, in Europe, and the EU is, I would say, one of the world leaders in food safety, um, and we should keep that role. Um, but at the same time, we need to ensure that the regulatory approval process for these new products um, are clear, are transparent, are evidence-based. Um, and if we can do that in Europe, and I have a lot of confidence um, that we can, um, then that could really set the standard for the rest of the world. Um, we need to make sure, though, in the regulation space that um, small and medium-sized enterprises have the chance um, to, to come to market, um, and their regulation can play a huge role. Um, and the other, the other aspect is, is really agenda setting, um, and that's the previous question about the UN Food System Summit. We have COP26 this year happening in Europe, in, in Glasgow. There, Europe can really um, set the stage and put alternative proteins firmly on the agenda. Great. 
Yeah, uh, another question, um, a very specific question um, about a particular stakeholder from uh, Mariam Asidia. Uh, she asks, uh, so she mentions that the SAPE report, uh, as you said, Celine, touches on the fact that trust is key to consumers who are interested in sustainable food. Uh, and she asks, how could catering companies or restaurants, for example, build trust uh, in terms of messaging with consumers on alternative proteins? I'm interested to know yeah, who might have some, uh, some thoughts on this. Uh, John? I think it's really, really difficult for them to do so. Mm. But like, of course, uh, uh, what they can do uh, is the same as they can do in all other areas, like be transparent in what they're doing and use, uh, in, including being able to document who their suppliers are, like, you know, in the, so that it's very clear, like that they use credible suppliers. So that's what they can do in the short term. Um, so uh, else, you know, what they are lacking is the same as what the rest of us, like as consumers are lacking, which is, uh, sufficient certification and documentation and labeling systems that uh, that you know where there are uh, third party organizations that certify and 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 uh, and label uh, because as it is now without these these things we we only have the credibility of the companies which is of course uh, like companies vary in credibility and 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 some companies have a high level of credibility and trust but uh, all research shows that third third party labeling and certification is the key to uh, earn consumer trust. Like I mean, it's it's good to have confidence, but like control is even better. There's uh, this I think this is, is attributed to Lenin or Stalin or one of these uh, dictatorial uh, leaders from from the former Soviet Union. But but. Uh, but there's some truth in it, like that, that uh, we actually, we need that kind of regulation and, and uh, to, to uh, assist companies in, uh, in order to being able to, to do that, their job in creating trust. Okay. So, yeah, so catering companies certainly have a role to play, but yeah, there's perhaps more responsibility on the regulators and uh, in terms of labeling. Yeah. Um, one last question before I want to hear some final words from uh, each of you. Uh, but I wanted to bring in uh, this question from uh, Tina Ristola, uh, who asks, what could passing the plant-based uh, milk labeling reg regulations, uh, I suppose here she's talking about the um, regulations that were voted on in the European Parliament, I think last year, uh, what could this mean for marketing alternative uh, proteins to consumers? Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm happy to jump in on that. So yeah, I think that refers to um, one of the amendments, um, of the current reform package to the common agricultural policy. That is, as you rightly said, was passed by the European Parliament last October, and it's currently in negotiations between the Council of the EU, um, the European Parliament and, and trilogues with the, with the Commission. Um, so these proposals would actually be quite harmful to, um, for European consumers um, and to the whole European plant-based dairy sector, because in effect, they would ban terms like creamy or um, substitute for butter or yogurt style to be used on plant-based dairy products. They could even go so far as to completely forbid a plant-based dairy product to use um, a milk carton, like the shape of the normal milk carton as they are packaging, um, because it would apparently um, just show an equivalence to the dairy product. This is really bizarre and really harmful um, proposals um, because consumers are not confused by plant-based dairy products. They do not think this is actually from, from, from a cow. No, they actually buy them because they want to buy more plant-based dairy. So we really hope that the European Council, um, the Council of the EU and member states um, will not go forward with this proposal in the negotiations. And we are actively working together with others to try to convince them um, and make that happen. Okay, so challenges ahead. Uh, thank you all very much, um, participants, for your questions. It's been really interesting to, to hear your thoughts and uh, yeah, put your questions to, uh, to our speakers. Uh, I wanted to come to each of our, our speakers uh, just for some final words before we uh, wrap this up. Um, just to hear a little bit about what you'll take from uh, this discussion or what you think are the main challenges ahead. Chris, perhaps, could I come to you first for some final thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Um... It's a real pleasure and excitement to be involved in this kind of work. I think that uh, developing 
a high quality and affordable feasible alternatives to animal products is some of the most important work to be done today um we seem to be kind of much better at hard science than we are at social science um you know we can put a man on the moon but we can't get him not to eat cheeseburgers anymore so i think that using the one to meet the other is a really great thing to be doing and providing consumers with the products that they want to eat um minimizing the amount of behavior change that we are requiring from them uh is the way to do this and i do think that it comes down to the individual at the end of the day um you know obviously corporations need to do the right thing and governments need to do the right thing but ultimately their decisions are all driven by individuals as well if voters don't like it in the case of governments or consumers in the case of companies um then they won't do it uh so individual behavior change is very important and these are the innovations that we need to make that happen so uh, congratulations to everybody involved in this space i guess thanks very much uh, chris uh, Celine, I wonder uh, about your, your final thoughts, what you'll take from this webinar. Yes, so uh, I'm no expert, but I followed this work closely and um, listening to this very interesting conversation today, I think my take home messages are that there's, this is one of the many levers that can be activated to promote this transition to more sustainable food system. Uh, the change in the narrative uh, is also, I think, a strong message that I take home and uh, that there's also a, a need for uh, more evidence to move things forward. Uh, this is a very uh, niche and uh, new domain, I think, uh, where society and many other stakeholders will need information, scientific information. Um, I also going back to the SAPEA report, the, this like one in many levers, they need to be evaluated and monitored constantly to see what impact they have and to gain traction. And this is one of the recommendations of the advisors as well. And finally, yeah, seeing the diversity of citizens uh, in nations, in Europe, in the world, there's no one size fits all in the way this can progress. Um, so, yeah, these are my take home messages. Brilliant. Thanks. Yeah, I think you've summed up a lot of the, the complexity of the, the situation. Yeah. Uh, Alex, what about you? Um, your final thoughts on this? Yeah, I also found this a really fascinating discussion. And you're right, Celine, there's so much more to, to discuss in the space. Um, for me, really, um, and that's why I'm glad this, this webinar um, is focused on consumers. Me, really, one of the main takeaways is. Um, that we should not put the main burden of food system change on individual consumers. They do have a huge role to play, of course, but um, as a society, um, we can make changes on the policy level that really facilitate this transition. And the most important one that John mentioned is, um, yeah, we need to meet consumers where they are. Um, we need to get the price right. We need to get the taste right. And that we can do if policymakers decide to make this a priority. Um, and so we need that investment. We need that um political will um and that's what i hope will come out of this brilliant thanks and and finally uh john some some final thoughts from you uh, I, I i think the the three others have, have covered like the most of the, the i uh, i think the most important thing is is like the product development the the regulatory framework framework that we have uh, been speaking about uh but i um I also have to say that that so want to emphasize the consumer research side that uh, most of what we have been discussing today are the fundamentals, which are kind of needed to get this market off the ground, uh, and as and and I completely agree that that uh, as as Celine said, like this is one of the important things that can be be a lever for. For developing a, a, a transition to a sustainable food system, among a range of other things, but this is also a special thing, which are special in the sense that these are new products, and there is a side where, like, we know that it's easier to get consumer like interest and acceptance than to get them to actually act if they're not forced to act, and there we we still need quite a lot of of of, of work to to. Um, develop the the effective ways of of helping consumers do the transition from intention to action right 
Thank you very much. So yeah, making this move from perception change to opinion change to a change in action. I think uh, it's been very informative. We've managed to uh, tackle a, a lot of questions here in a short space of time. And I, I'm sure that uh, some perceptions and opinions will have changed as well throughout the, the course of this conversation. A big thank you to all of you for joining us uh, in this, as I say, the final webinar in our series. Um, please don't hesitate uh, to check the SAPEA website uh, for videos of our past events. Um, on a whole range of topics from COVID-19, the farm to fork strategy, um, to the EU's role in the global transition, and even a conversation on the role of chefs. Um, so you're very welcome uh, to have a look at the website where this recording will also be posted. Um, but finally, uh, again, just to give a final thanks to all of our speakers, um, to our co-hosts, uh, Good Food Institute, as well as Sapea. And a big thank you to all of you uh, for all of your questions and participation throughout the webinar. It's been uh, really interesting. Many thanks to everyone, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thanks so much.